Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to our Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the 1940s. Now, the 1940s, uh, that's tricky for us uh, because uh, we have a lot of evolution really quickly. Uh, World War II were declared, of course, in uh, 1939 there, and uh, it was a race to see who could produce the best performing aircraft that worked. The general philosophy at the time, of course, was uh, let's just design an airplane with a bigger and bigger engine and wrap the airframe around it. Uh, that was the concept, and uh, many, many fighters of the war were basically designed on that. But you had other evolutions that came with it as well, and that's what we'll be exploring. So this is the P-38. Uh, this is my absolute favorite World War II plane. Uh, there's so many things I love about this plane. Uh, but a couple things that um, make it kind of evolutionary, of course, is the way that a lot of things are really starting to get standardized. Uh, Materials-wise, you'll notice uh, our, our got flush rivets now in order to reduce drag, which is very, very good. And you'll notice the presence of very, very large water-cooled engines. And one of the things I'm really impressed with with this program is we have those little tiny little radiators, which will actually sneeze, automatically open themselves up. Oh man, that's a nice evolution. Uh, the other thing you'll notice here is I want to kind of stick my head down here is we have a lot of new instrumentation here, which is going to help us out here. We're getting a more standardization as far as manifold pressure and RPM controls goes. You can see we're chilling right there. We're getting some standardization as far as where to put instruments. So you'll notice the, basically our attitude indicator is now large and in charge in the minute. You'll notice, of course, we have a couple new navigational tools over on the left here for doing some radio navigation. You also see the presence of things like coolant temperature as well as carburetor air. You'll see we still have generators. Sigh. But again, we'll get alternators pretty soon as it is. You also notice that we have oxygen cylinders. We're not pressurized yet. Uh, that's going to be a few years before we have that. Our throttle quadrant is significantly simpler than uh, especially what we saw over on the DC-3. And you also see because we're a wartime aircraft, a lot of all of our cooling things in order to give us maximum performance. Again, the octane of fuel had been progressively working its way up. And now we have all sorts of wonderful tools for the purposes of keeping them nice and cool. So again, we have a turbocharger and a supercharger on this particular one. Uh, basically, that all needs to give us as much power as we absolutely, absolutely can. Another thing they did for this aircraft too, which is why I chose this one, when I had so many good ones to pick from, is you'll notice the presence of the fact that we have our regular good old-fashioned flaps there, which is kind of nice. But we also have the ability to uh, have these two propeller blades turning towards each other in order to make this aircraft much, much easier to handle in the air. But um, I'll stop talking, and I'll go ahead and get this thing going here. And uh, one of the cool things here that I love about this generation of airplanes is how uh, once it gets going um you can see here this is um atmospheric pressure i'm at 30 manifold pressure i can actually just stop this thing right up to full power and you can actually watch it uh, basically raise itself and it takes no time at all getting this thing airborne which is just incredible given the air notice by the way the happy shaky instruments there which just kind of it's what you had and again we'll get a little bit of speed here we we'll give it a nice little tug there's another thing you probably observed and that's the fact that our aircraft is no longer a tail dragger and you can see right there, our hydraulic pressure took a massive dump uh, when I went ahead and uh, put the landing gear up. You can see they retract nice and thing. Notice we have the presence of doors to help us out. Now, remember when I was talking about those radiator flaps? You can see they're massively opened right now to basically keep us cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and reduce myself to a more reasonable amount of power here. It's uh, pretty easy to do in this aircraft. You just come down right about there. Good old-fashioned Packard engines. I'll make it nice and simple for us. And you can see just how much faster this airplane is. Uh, my speed now in a climb is faster than the DC-3 was in crew. So just to give you an idea of just the differences in performance here. And of course, uh, this is a war plane. This is not a civilian airplane. So there's gonna be a lot of things that we're gonna skip over comfort wise. But that being said, there's a lot of really good comfort options. Our seat is now adjustable. We can carry external fuel tanks, uh, which is a great little tool there. I uh, notice the presence of radios. Uh, we have a transponder. Those are actually add-ons basically to make the flight sim compatible. Uh, we probably wouldn't have a lot of that tech, although they did have some tech like it in World War II. Our climb rate is astronomical. Uh, you can just take a look right there and I just get a feel for that. I'm doing 4,100 feet per minute in a climb. So again, completely different level of performance in this era than uh, the era that basically preceded it. And again, it's a World War II plane. We have things like inverted carburetors. Uh, yeah, we still have carburetors. Uh, the Germans are the ones who uh, did really, really good work with fuel injection, but we wouldn't see fuel injected engines for a very, very long time. We're also seeing liquid cooled engines come back. Uh, we didn't just have those back in the tens. Uh, they came back a little bit just because again, aerodynamically they did a little bit better, a little bit harder to be uh, take care of again, because if something goes wrong with your coolant system, you've got real, real problems ahead of you as far as that goes but just to give you an idea of how much the performance of these things have improved and i love the attitude indicator there i'm gonna go ahead and i'll level myself off 
Again, very, very responsive controls. I'm not having to work. And these were actually boosted controls. Uh, we do not have an autopilot in this aircraft, unfortunately. But again, a lot of these aircraft of this era, some, once they start getting to a certain transport size, they all had autopilots. Again, just longer flights. But I'm just going to go ahead and level this thing off. I reduced my power just a tiny bit here, uh, just to demonstrate here, to give you an idea of how powerful this thing is. Pull that back just a little bit. And I can see I'm just looking down and doing... Looks about 250 miles per hour indicated. So um, we are not slow. Well, we're going hundreds of miles an hour faster than the first aircraft that came out just 40 years prior. And again, all the performance of the world. And we finally have airplanes that are not conventional landing gear. They're basically a landomatic gears, if you want to kind of imagine. So the war, of course, plenty of airplanes to pick from from that. Like I said, I want my favorite kind of a thing. But what gets that's very, very interesting is how the evolution of aircraft changed when we got to the post-war period. As soon as the war was over, the United States and all the countries involved we were quick to demobilize, going from you know, 15, 16, 20 million soldiers down to, you know, peacetime numbers, like 200,000. So, of course, you took all these pilots and you sent them back home and they said, hey, you know, it'd be nice if I had a plane of my own. And that was the hope. It didn't quite manifest that way, but it was still pretty successful in its own sort of way. So we had aircraft like this, uh, the small company based in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, you might know them. I think they're called Cessna, Chesna, Cessna. Uh, developed this airplane called the Cessna 170. And again, notice we're still tail dragger airplane. Notice we're still present on grass here. Uh, pretty typical for this era, even though so much time had passed. And when we climb in here, you will notice some things have gotten a little more familiar uh, now that we're getting outside of that kind of early days of airplanes. Go ahead and give this thing just a little bit more power to hold it a little bit better of an idle, about a thousand. Still let in our fuel. Little things you'll notice. Uh, first of all, uh, we got some of that uh, good old fashioned interior. We actually have a little bit of creature comfort. So this is a little bit softer. You'll notice the presence of a fire extinguisher. Good choice. Uh, of course, you'll see a little fuel selector here on the floor. Look at the way this was. It was a needle that you moved. Man, this needle would bend so bad. Uh, you also notice I can adjust my seat now, uh, which is kind of a nice little quick. So, if you look in the back seat, I have safety belts for the back passengers. So um, if you look at the back, no window. Uh, we'll get a window, many, many versions of the Cessna 170 kind of forward. Uh, you'll love the fact that the little handle for getting in and out is like, <laughs> look at that. Of course, we have the ability to open the window too. I mean, that is a Cessna window right there. I've had these things pop open. I mean, flight more than once that I care to admit. You'll notice that uh, we have a good visibility here. We have a couple instruments to make it a little bit easier. I can actually open up a little vent now to uh, ventilate my passengers or ventilate things from outside. You'll notice the presence of fuel gauges on the inside of the plane. I love how it says no takeoff. <laughs> So great. You also notice that some things have changed as far as our controls and stuff like that goes. This is a 1941, by the way, for this bigger one. I got my ears. 47. There we go. 47. Sorry about that. So, of course, uh, take a look at this. We have a couple new things, too. Uh, one thing you'll notice is our electrical switches are switches. Uh, you'll have to pull the start and we'll have to push it on the floor. Uh, you'll notice if I want to go ahead and do something, I can pull it out or I can push it in just like that. There's a little switch. That is my switch now. You'll notice that uh, we don't have circuit breakers yet. Uh, we still have fuses, but uh, we still have pretty standardized fuses. Notice we have a tool for actually communicating with the people around us. Uh, the other thing you'll notice here, which I love, is we have this good old fashioned handle. This is our flaps handle here. It's our flaps lever is actually built into the floor. They're not powered. You'll notice it's easy to get to the pitch trim control here. Uh, you'll notice my controller itself is a big hunk of metal and make it nice and easy. Uh, yes, the concept is you would held onto this with a hand and you pick this up and talked to the people in air traffic control and hope that they could hear you and you could hear them. Again, you have a little speaker built in here. You also notice we have a couple more standardized instruments. Uh, you'll notice our airspeed indicators starting to get some markings on it. We actually have a white range now for our flaps. Uh, you'll notice the standard attitude indicator, altimeter. Uh, we have no special instrument navigation tools. We also have the presence of some very, very early days, things like alternators instead of generators, which are wonderful. We also have a nice little CDI indicator here, so we could pick it. This is not a standard radio of that era. We wouldn't see anything like this. We also have this thing, which is really fascinating. Stall warning, safe flight indicator. Yeah. You actually had the early days of stall warning tools as well, even though we had those back up right receding this as well. You also have Hobbs meters and things like that. You have vacuum tools that basically tell us we have carburetor. But again, everything's starting to get a little more standardized and look a little bit more like what you look like. Control-wise, uh, things were pretty nice. I love how we have a vernier throttle. It's a big handle. We just jam it in. Our tail wheel is steerable on this aircraft, uh, which is a really nice touch there. Of course, it's still a tail dragger, so it's very, very challenging to get this thing up in the air. Now, the fascinating thing, there's your stall warning. Uh, the good folks over at Cessna there actually came up with a whole line of 
of aircraft like this. Uh, you had like the business airplanes. You had all sorts of really, 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 really nice airplanes from this area. The Cessna 140, the 150 that came out a couple years later. The commuter Cessnas, the little tiny ones. I love how we have an actual stall indicator. It doesn't move correctly, but I'm going to ignore that because it's still absolutely awesome. But this is sort of the beginning of what we think of as kind of like modern airplanes. They still fly these, by the way. We have, our instruments are starting to get standardized. You know, we're starting to get a compass built into the panel. Things are getting a little bit better. We have exterior lighting, uh, something that we didn't have a heck of a lot of. I can set the power by just looking. I don't have to kind of guess. It gives you a little standard colored arcs that we're starting to see in our different communication. Give it a little panel, pull panel back. And we're starting to get speeds for civilian airplanes for that are only 120, 140 horsepower of like 100 knots to 110. 10 knots, which is really, really impressive, uh, given that, of course, uh, you're coming back from World War II, especially our P-38 there. Uh, this is a bit of a downgrade as far as speed goes, but at the same token is, this was sort of the beginning of general aviation kind of as we know it. We're getting things that are a little bit safer. We're getting things that are easier to control. We have the ability to communicate with folks on the ground. Oh, who's playing today? Uh, and we have all those different capabilities wrapped into a package that actually looks relatively familiar. We're also starting to see some instruments and even things like attitude indicators that even though they're 1940 40s tech, we'll actually see all the way through modern times, depending on what particular airplane that you managed to get for that particular day. Also, the fact that uh, the cylinder head temperature, which uh, we can see very prominently there, we don't even see that on modern Cessna 172. So I find that kind of interesting, unless, you, of course, you have a JDM or something like that installed. But it's just so fascinating to see that that was standard equipment back then. But I just love the simplicity. I love the fact that the wheels is junk piece of metal. I love the fact we have actual differential braking now, something that uh, we didn't have a lot of leading up into the point and it just makes it so much easier to control in such a safer experience now if this is what we can do with the 1940s what happens when we get to the 1950s well that's something we'll have to see in our next episode of the microsoft flight simulator evolution of aircraft design